Hello and welcome to another edition of Santos on Sports. I'm Santos. The guy next to me is Santos. The guy on the end is not Santos. The guy uh-huh. on the end is a very, <laughs> very knowledgeable hockey guy. You know, we're right in the middle of this right here, baby. Right here, right in the middle of all this hockey stuff. Yeah, we want the cup, and you know, Bergie's gonna come through. And oh yes, we're all fired up and ready to go. Well, that gentleman right there, he coached New Bedford High School for nine years, thirty-two years. Behind the bench at SMU and UMass Dartmouth won multiple championships, and I was happy to call the games for UMass Dartmouth, which was a lot of fun. Mr. John Riley joins us. John, how are you? I'm doing great, Paul. It's a, it's an honor to be invited on this podcast. <laughs> well, I see your shirt there, right? I, I love that shirt because I remember that year well. So exciting. Yeah, 2008 was a, was a bellwether year at UMass Dartmouth. It was our third consecutive uh, NCAA tournament uh, appearance, uh, and and it was the, it was hosted at uh, Hetland Arena. Uh, it was a great night. Yeah, it was great. A lot of fun. A lot of fun. Well, I know that you bleed the black and gold like myself. Oh. That other gentleman, he he bleeds a different black and gold. <laughs> Yeah, that was black and gold, but uh, we bleed the real black and gold right here in New England, the Boston Bruins. And, you know, they got by Washington, which was great. Now they're in this tough series with the Islanders. And I know you look on paper, it seems like the Islanders, you know, the Bruins are better than them a little bit. But this series makes me nervous, coach. I, 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 I don't like this. I, I can see them getting knocked off by the Islanders. What do you think? It's a definite possibility. You know, the Islanders uh, were at this in the same point of time a year ago down in the bubble, and they made it to the conference uh, finals against Tampa Bay. Uh, so they did one better than the Bruins a year ago. And, and uh, you know, earlier this year, you remember, uh, um, while all the, most of the games, I think all of the games were on the island, they, they took it to the Bruins. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm concerned about this series because uh, you're down to seven really good teams and, and an outlier, some team named the Montreal Canadiens. I don't know how they're still in it. Uh, and, and they beat Winnipeg last night, by the way. But, you, you, you know, um, hey, the Bruins have, in my opinion, as good a chance as anybody to win this thing. Coach, uh, mirror images of one another, I think, these two teams with personnel and and what they do with four check-in and everything else. What did you see from game one to game two that made the Islanders play better? I thought it was their four check-in created a lot of turnovers in the neutral zone and, of course, in the defensive zone, which led to not like shiny goals, but, you know, real tough goals to get by Tuka Rask. Uh, what did you see from game one to game two, specifically with the Islanders? Well, in, in game two, Chris, I, I think it came down to – what, what the great Sean Walsh, the former coach at the University of Maine, referred to as puck luck. And you, you, look, at, you look at that game, the, the two, two kind of freakish events that happened to the same Bruins defenseman, uh, Jer- uh, rookie Jeremy Lozon, the first Islanders goal, uh, power play goal by the Islanders, goes in off, uh, off his skate pass to Karask. And, and then the uh, very unfortunate, uh, maybe it was ill-advised attempt to pass the puck across to uh, his partner. Hits hits coil on the back of the heel of the skate, and and uh, you, you know the rest is history. Uh, I, I I do think that uh, the Islanders played a much better game in game two than in, than in game one. Um, I thought Tuukka uh kept us in game two for most of it. But it, it, it wouldn't wouldn't in the least bit surprise me for the Bru- if the Bruins won tonight. Well, uh, Bobby O'Brien just commented. He's doing some statistical work over here, and he commented that in playoff history, when the series is one to one and the road team wins game three, they go on and win seventy percent of the time. So obviously, an important game tonight. <laughs> of course, yeah. anything can happen. Yeah. Uh, by the way, Michael Firmino says Coach Raleigh's a great guy. So people are typing in some uh, positive stuff over here. I'm, 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 Michael Michael Firmino uh, has a good handle on life. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good, good. Well, you know, as a coach, you talk about that rookie making a mistake, and it was a mistake, and he went down the ice, and after the goal was scored, he 
smash the stick into the net under the you know over the crossbar and all that yeah. and i heard some people say hey maybe you gotta sit him and put the next guy up and stuff like that how do you balance between you know going right back to the guy who made a mistake and showing confidence in that guy or maybe bringing another guy that you want to give a chance into the game yeah well the well there is a jared tenorti who who played very well in the last uh, game uh, of the uh washington series who could go in there but you know uh lausanne played in the playoffs last year down in the bubble. And, um, you know, he's, he's, he's been injured on a couple of occasions this year, but I, th I think, uh, I think you, you keep the group together as, as much as possible. And, and I would certainly go right back with, with, with Lausanne tonight. Coach, you, you've seen a lot of hockey, obviously, whether it's the Bruins and your coaching career, what is it about this perfection line that makes them so good together outstanding more than other lines what do they have besides you know the chemistry obviously is one thing but what is it about this line that puts them probably top in the nhl and says this is the line that people say wow uh, what they got really something here in boston what is it in your eyes that makes pasternak Marchand, and bergeron that great well i think uh pierre mcguire hit it on the head the other night uh in game one he's inside the glass and he, and he said that he, he, in watching the perfection line, he could see how great they were on television. He says, but seeing them in person, it's, it, it's just another world. And, you, you, you know, you have three very uh, complementary type players. Uh, you, you've got the arguably, uh, and this is not coming from a, a Boston Bruins homer, uh, arguably the best all-around player in the NHL, uh, this season and past seasons, and, and uh, Patrice Bergeron in the middle. You, you, you have an instigator who who uh, uh, has a knack of scoring big goals in in uh, Marchand, and and Pasta just can passes one of those guys when he puts the puck towards the net. Somehow it finds a way of going in. They 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 are a tremendous tremendous line. Well, you know, goaltending is such an important part of the game. I think one time you may have even said, or people say, you start with the goalie and work your way out. Obviously, mm -hmm. you need offense and you need defense. You need everything, special teams. But Tuka Rask, I've always been a defender of Tuka. I think a lot of people get on his back a little bit. Uh, every once in a while, there'll be like a fluky goal, like that one that went off the backboards and went in. Somebody would say, well, that, you know, you should have had that one or whatever. Um, and, you know, he's got the big contract coming up. Before we get to that, um, what's your view of Tuca? You know, like he can play great. He can like make great saves in a period and everything else. And, you know, I got to tell you, I'm a big defender of Tuca, but when that breakaway, it was a breakaway that felt like it went off for 30 seconds. <laughs> yeah. As the guy was coming down the ice, I was like, yeah, he's not, he never seems to make that stop at that moment. I I, I don't know. There's something like, you know, like Tim Thomas that year they won. He, he makes that, that kind of stuff. You know what I'm saying? That, that clutch moment yeah. you really need. So what, what's your assessment of Tuca? Well, hey, you look back at game two, and the Bruins could have easily lost that game five to three if it wasn't for Tuca. He made he made a lot of good saves during the course of the course of that game, and and, and you know some some nights uh, things are preordained to happen, and uh, you look back at game seven uh, against uh, St. Louis Blues a few years ago, and, and for some reason that was just meant. To happen for the St. Louis Blues, and and I think that's the way it was. Uh, the way the puck was bouncing the other night for the Islanders. But I'm a big I'm a big Tuka Rask fan. Uh, he he has played phenomenally for for many seasons for the Bruins, and I, and I think he really deserves to be the winning goalie on a, a Stanley Cup championship team. My only my only concern about Tuka is once once you put a microphone in front of him. Uh, he usually says something that will leave your head scratching. Uh, that that doesn't have anything to do with his on ice performance. I'm glad he's our goaltender. You know, you look at the Washington series, and the first two games were back and forth, and now Game Three is a pivotal game, and and uh, uh, the the rookie goalie for Washington uh, makes a blunder, leaving the puck behind the net, and. You know, Craig Smith comes around and jams it in, and the Bruins win in overtime. Hey, Washington was never the same after that. Uh, there was very little fight in the Capitals in games four and five. The reason they knew they they they, 
they weren't going to win because they didn't have the goaltender that, that could get the job done. Now, the island is we're all already on goalie number two. Now, now this kid, this kid has played very good against the Bruins all season long, but he, 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 you know, he, he left a couple of rebound chances the other night. So, you know, I, I think, I think in the battle of the goaltenders, uh, uh, I think the Bruins uh, uh, have a little bit better there. And I, I hope that's the way it continues. Yeah, that was interesting, Coach. In the regular season, when the Islanders got off to that fast start, they were 5-0 and o against Boston, and it was all behind Volamov. Yeah. And then, all of a sudden, the last three games, two of them, Sorokin started. He got beat by Boston. In the final game, Volamov started. He got injured. Sorokin came in. The Bruins beat him in overtime, and it was 5-3 in the series, the Islanders. Now they go to game one. He starts Sorokin. He yeah, he's gonna beat. start. He's gonna start Sorokin there, Chris. Yeah. But he, then he came back and he, he, he two, beat he the vaunted. Uh, Sorokin beat the vaunted Pittsburgh Penguins. Yes, he's no, start that's true. But, but he started Val Valamov game two. So you sat back and said, "Well, wait a minute now. You know, wh which way is he gonna go? Because Valamov actually won the game. So I'll be curious to see if he stays with Valamov or goes oh, yeah. to Sorokin." Oh, I, I, absolutely! He has to stay with yeah. Volamov. Yeah, and and, and and I mean, he he played well enough to win the other night, and and he had the Bruins number during the regular season early on. But you know, uh, the Bruins team, the last uh, 12, 14 games of the regular season was a little bit different than the Bruins team uh, back in January and February when when the NHL season was just getting going, and it kind of had something to do with the trade that Don Sweeney made. <laughs> Coach, let me ask you about Charlie McAvoy, right? I mean, I'm watching this yeah. kid, and, you know, the last couple of years since, you know, he's been developing for the Bruins, I mean, he is as good as a defenseman as I've seen there in a while. I mean, this he, like, runs the whole show back there when he's out there. What's your assessment of Charlie? Charlie McAvoy is a very gifted player. He he he's he's uh, he skates very well. He makes a a, a beautiful uh, breakout pass to get, to get the offense going. Uh, he's he's improving defensively. My one concern about McAvoy is you watch the game and and any chance an opponent has uh, an opportunity to finish a check on him, they they're really banging him and. I just wonder if if that's going to take a toll on him uh, uh, each night. If it takes a toll on him each night, and a cumulative toll on him in each series, uh, because you know he's he's playing he's playing with his his old BU buddy Matt Grizzlick, and Matt Grizzlick does not uh, he's not Zdeno Chara as far as the physical uh, piece, and, and, and you know you've got to hand it you've got to hand it to McAvoy. He 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 had the top cop in the NHL beside him his first couple seasons, and now he's got his best buddy who who physically just uh, is overwhelmed at time by by some NHL players. Uh, and, but McAvoy is he's the real deal. Coach, long season, regular season, and now you get to the playoffs. To you, what are some of the differences of playoff hockey compared to regular season hockey? The, the the intensity level, Chris, uh, off the charts. Uh, the magnifying of of, of uh, small plays, uh, uh, turnovers, uh, poor changes, uh, too many men in the ice. You, you, you know, everything just gets totally blown up uh, and magnified. Uh, so there is there's no wiggle room at all uh, this time of the year. You know, and, and tonight. Tonight, the pressure is more on the Islanders, I think, than it is on the Bruins. Yeah. If the Bruins go up 2-1 after tonight, you might see them come back to Boston with a 3-1 advantage. But you, 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 yeah, uh, Likewise, if the Islanders hold serve tonight, then uh, Saturday night will be a huge pressure game for Boston because they, they can't go down 3-1. Well, Coach – you said those words, too many men on the ice, and even though it's like 30 years later, every time I see a call for too many men on the ice, I get this tingly feeling going up in my back because 1979, it feels like the other day, doesn't it? When they, they had them, they had the Canadians, they had them cornered, and they, they they got that goal with like four minutes left, and they just, they just had that game, and then they, they lost, you know. In, oh. in, in the forum, no less. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 
Uh, Don, Don, Don Cherry, it's, ama it's amazing he's still alive after that because of that. That would that would have put that would have put me away right then and there. <laughs> well, I just want to ask you something, Coach. Uh, you've been out of coaching now for about five years, and I know you're a teacher too as well. Had a nice career there, nice time coaching UMass Dartmouth. Uh, you said 32 years, nine in New Bedford High School, enjoying retirement. I know. Uh, you know, when you're watching one of these games, you ever think, oh, boy, you know, I, I miss it a little bit. I do miss it a little bit being behind that bench and the crowd's going wild at Hetland and, you you know, you're going for that championship and, you know, all that stuff. Uh, part of you has to miss it a little bit. Am I right? I miss it maybe a little, 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 <laughs> little, little, little bit. <laughs> but I am much happier where I am today. Well, you know what it is, because I think we think about you behind the bench during the championship game, but we forgot about all the preparation that it took to get to that point, all the work, right? Well, yeah. it, 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 you know, the wins are great, uh, but but it's the losses that that, that kill you. And you know, there's <laughs> there's nothing there's nothing worse on uh, playing on a Saturday night, and you, you have a three three and a half hour bus ride back after the game that that you lost. And you got to get up and go out on the road and recruiting on on Sunday. It's it, it, it was work, you know. And and I was trying my last few years. I was trying to figure out, okay, when's the right time? And um, you, you know, with with each class that comes in, there's always somebody that that hooks you. That yeah, well, I'm gonna stay with I'm gonna stay with this this guy or this this group because they're great players and great guys to be around and a lot of fun and 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 you know. It, turning 60, becoming 62, and then 64, and, and 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 said to myself, "Okay, you're 65 years old. You don't want to be buried as the uh, as the uh, coach at UMass Dartmouth. So, this is a nice number, 65. That's 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 the number you're supposed to retire at. And I'm glad I did. I'm glad I did. I'm I, I I I I'm thrilled that I coached the well, New Bedford High Hockey. I I came down here as as a 24 year old. Uh, uh, very wet behind the ears, uh, young coach, and and um, New Bedford High was very very good to me. I had some great moments there. Hey, my last captain at at, at New Bedford High, Scott Allen. I mean, I followed his career uh, uh, in the American Hockey League and the National Hockey League, uh, and uh, I just I just spoke to him last week. As a matter of fact, uh, New Bedford High was. Uh, I mean, I mean, uh, uh, well of life, you know, and and uh, and then to go to UMass time, but the, but thirty two years, it's like okay, hey, listen, uh, enough's enough. Coach, uh, speaking of speaking of coaching, uh, thoughts on Barry Trotz and thoughts on Butch Cassidy. Um, you know, obviously Barry's uh, a little bit older than than Butch, but uh, your thoughts on the two of them and and what they've done uh, with these teams, and how do you compare them? to some of the elite coaches? Trotz is, uh, Trotz is an old school guy. I mean, he's a Lou Lamorello pick. Uh, you know, anytime that you can hire uh, a Stanley Cup champion coach and put him behind your bench, you know, you've got something there. And, and you know, he's, he, just, uh, he just can get the job done. He knows what he's doing. Cassidy, on the other hand, I mean, he, he, had, he had one run with the Capitals way, way back when, uh, a short, short stint as it was, but, it, but, you know, since he's come to Boston, boy, he's, he's, he's been great for the, great for the Bruins. Um, I, I, I think he's, he's more a modern day coach than, than Trotz is. Uh, and he needs to win one. He needs, he just needs to win one to validate it. Yeah. Well, you mentioned coaching and I know we're going to talk mostly hockey, but, a lot going on with the Celtics in terms of coaching. Uh, obviously, Danny Ainge stepping out. Uh, Brad Stevens moving over to general manager. They got to get another coach. Uh, I know coaching, it, it really doesn't matter what sport you're talking about, right? I mean, you know, things can go wrong. Players can get hurt. They'll, you know, in the media, they say, well, that's a bunch of excuses and all that. You know, a real great coach told me one time, hey, you have to have players. <laughs> I don't care how, <laughs> how good a coach you are, right? I mean, they lost Gordon Haywood. They lost, uh, you know, Horford, you know, a lot of people. You know, Kyrie, even though he turned out to be a pain in the neck, he's still talented. He left, right? So now all of a sudden you just lost, like, all these talented players. How are you supposed to win uh, 50 games w without the talent? What, what do you think about that? Do you think, 
you know, Stevens um, may be unfairly blamed for the record the last couple of years? What do you think? Well, I think I think I think if you're going to play the blame game, it's a joint venture between uh, Danny and and Brad Stevens. Um, I I think Brad Stevens is uh, 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 or was a very good NBA coach. Was he good enough to uh, win an NBA championship? I'm not sure. I think that if he had stayed in the in, at the NCAA, I think he would have won a national championship at that level before winning a world championship at the professional level. And you know, one thing about this move now, you, you, you're you're taking uh, uh, Brad Stevens. It's one thing that it's one thing to have taken him from Butler and put him on the bench of the Boston Celtics. But now you're putting him as the president of basketball operations, i.e. general manager, um, with I don't know what experience he has in that. I, I, that, to me, is the most curious uh, decision that was made. And and I was listening to um, all the experts out there on EEI when I was driving home from Boston yesterday, and, and the, the general consensus amongst those ex- experts – uh, was well, they broke the uh, Celtics owed him six more years of salary. Yeah, right. So this, <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is one way of paying him off. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm not sure about that. Uh, and you know, he's got a he's got a big decision to make regarding who the next coach will be. Um, all of those former number one draft picks that that Danny had stashed away, they're all gone now. I, I think it, I think it's going to be a tough overhaul for the Celtics. Yeah, I'm agreeing with that one, uh, Paul. Um, you know, it, it's it's a two way street, and Danny and Brad had to work together. Remember, Danny was the one that was getting uh, the players for Brad, and then Brad has to do something with the players, and then Walker was hurt, and then Williams got hurt, and again, it was very difficult. But now when you're going to switch hands and Brad, uh, Brad now becomes that part of finding the picks and finding the players and getting free agents and making trades, it's a whole different ball game than just sitting behind the bench and, you know, trying to rotate players in and out, especially if they're all there and ready to play. So I think Coach is right with that one. Um, I think it's both guys. I just can't blame it on Brad and I just can't blame it on Danny. Uh, I think that's a two-way street. You got to work together as coach and owner. Um, and, and and make it work and make that organization better. So Brad will definitely have some tough things to uh, figure out for his team. And obviously it starts with the head coach. There's already about six people out there right now. Uh, and even one of them's a female. So she, she's, she's out there that may come through. Uh, another name that's been out there, uh, Sam Cassell, Jason Kidd, Chauncey Billups. So there's a host of names. Uh, I'm sure they'll, they'll they'll go through their organization and figure out, get their interviews, and then see who obviously start there, and then worry about the team after that. Yeah, if I could just interject, I th- I think the beginning of this precipitous fall started with uh, the signing of Kyrie. Yeah, you you know it. He's he's just a tough guy to coach, and and uh, you know there's. He, granted, he won he won a world championship with the Cavaliers, but he had some guy named LeBron James uh, riding <laughs> shotgun with him, you know. And, yeah, exactly. And, and 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 so the the whole Kyrie, uh, you know, the animosity uh, either he felt towards Tatum and Brown, or Brown and or Tatum felt towards him, and and you know the thing is slowly slowly falling falling apart. Coach, when no, you you coach. Guy, yeah, when, when you get a guy like Kyrie or even a guy like Marshian, coach, how do, how do you coach a, a player who's that great that probably doesn't have to do some of the things that he does, a.k.a. spit in someone's face or, or things like that? As a coach, how, how do you handle a, a player like that who's really that good and you don't think he should be doing some of the things that he does, but yet he still does it? Uh, with my shan, you uh, grab him by the shirt and jam him into the wall. <laughs> and, and, old school. Uh, and, oh wow, old school stuff right there. Wow. And and uh, <laughs> explain the situation, Kyrie. Uh, that's beyond me. My, that's beyond me to solve. 
Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting because you coach that high school level yeah. and then you coach that, you know, over at the, uh, at the uh, college level. <laughs> Uh, and then, of course, <laughs> once you get to the NBA, now it's a whole different ball game. You got these divas who now, you know, they get together and they go to one team to create a super team, like they did with Brooklyn, which is kind of annoying. Yeah. Um, but you know, the, the coaches in the NBA—they're almost like, I mean, the coach of Brooklyn. What, <laughs> what, what is it? We just roll the balls out there. I mean, <laughs> there's not a lot of coaching going on over there, right? He's Steve Nash, a, a, a decorated player, a great player. You, you, you know, but. Basically, he's he's uh, he's sitting there and you know watching watching the big three orchestrate wins, and and uh, y y you know you, I, I think Paul, you hit the nail on the head. It's it's uh, a player dominated league. Uh, you, you know how much effect is Brad Stevens going to have if 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 uh, if uh, Kevin Durant says I don't want to come to Boston, he ain't coming. Yeah, he, <laughs> exactly. You, you know and. Um, the, the, for some reason, for some reason, Boston isn't uh, 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 a landing place for for too many uh, too many players. And you know, I, I I hope they do it the old school way through drafting and trading and and and, and occasional uh, appropriate free agent signing. Paul, Paul, I think it's more of when you're getting those big three guys and them stars. I don't call it babysitting, but I think it's more of how do I control those because they're going to kind of run the show and, and run the team and get it going anyways. Yeah. You may say a couple of things in a timeout and say, well, all right, we're going to, you know, keep an eye on Tatum or we're going to run this particular offensive play. But I think it's more of just kind of controlling the minutes, make sure everyone gets their time, make sure everyone touches the ball, more of the kind of babysitting stuff than really the coaching things uh, that was kind of the old school style. This is more of a newer NBA. So it, it, it's a little different than what it used to be. Not easy, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> coach, I want to ask you, high school, college, is there a difference between, you know, when you were coaching the high school athletes, you know, you're talking about 14, 15, 16, 17-year-old kids, and then you went to 18 to 23, 24. That, that had to be a pretty big difference. Yeah, it, 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 was, it was a huge difference in the skill level. But, you know, the, the, what, what changed over the 32 years, when, when I first started uh, coaching at UMass Dartmouth and, and recruiting, Hey, we, we, we were all about uh, trying to get the, the, the greater Boston, primarily public high school uh, player. You know, if we could get a kid from an Arlington or a Bill Ricker or a Stoneham, you know, re real good public schools to come down. Boy, you, you know, boy, we, we did well. And then the next thing you know, uh, the parochial schools started taking over the PC highs and the Catholic memorials and the St. John prep. And, you know, so we, we shifted gears and, and and we're able to get you know a, a few players from those those teams, and that just elevated us a little bit more. And then, then the next thing you know, uh, prep school hockey seemed to be the the, the fertile ground. And, I mean, she's uh, we had kids from Tabor Academy and uh, Avon Old Farms. They're paying forty fifty thousand dollars to go to high school, and then coming to UMass wow. to 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 play, go to college, and in the play, and then. Finally, uh, finally, towards the end, uh, junior hockey uh, was the fertile recruiting ground. And, and not, now you're, you're, you're recruiting 18, 19, 20, 21 year olds. I, I remember one year uh, when school started in September, we had uh, a, a seven player recruiting class come in. And already, before the very first day of school, five out of the seven were already 21 years of age. So, wow, it, that was it, different. It, yeah, it, it, it changed so much. Uh, it, it, but, but you know the the players' needs changed so much uh, uh, in in my last few years. They, it, uh, we, it was there was a little bit of the NBA creeping into college hockey. <laughs> <laughs> All right, before we go in the final moments, uh, I don't know if you're into the prediction game. You may be, you may not be, but you know the series is tied one one. Right, uh, that last game could have gone either way. I was hoping that it would be like the Capital Series where, you know, you get up to two nothing. You had a chance to really bury him there. But it didn't happen. That's okay. It's one-to-one. -one. Um, you know, if you had to pick between the Bruins and the Islanders, wh which way would you go? Would you tilt a little bit toward the Bruins? Oh, please. <laughs> Ab absolutely. Here's what I hoped. Well, you know, you, you look at the game the other night. Hey, Charlie Coyle scores like three minutes in, and and, and then the thing the game turned. 
if if uh, if the Bruins win tonight, the Bruins will win the series in six games. If the Islanders win tonight, the Bruins will have to go seven games to move on to the next round. Wow. What do you think about that, Chris? Well, I I said Boston in six last week, Paul. So I, I'm sticking with Coach. I, I, I still think Boston in six. Uh, they're a good road team. They can win on the road uh, just as well as home. Um, you know, the, the perfection line can still do it. Um, are they supposed to be getting Craig Smith back? Yeah. Um, I get no, another player that's going to be coming back. So that kind of supports that second line with Hall uh, and Krejci. That will help them as well. Uh, I, I still think they can get it. I don't see enough production from the Islanders getting more shots on net. Uh, they struggle to really get uh, quality shots uh, on goal. And as Coach said, they were lucky to get some breaks go their way in game two. A couple of deflections off skates, a bad turnover at the end of the game, things like that. So until they start showing me a little bit more on the offense and generate more than maybe 22 shots a game, I'm not seeing it. I still think Boston in six. All right. Well, you know, I got to tell you something, uh, Coach Raleigh and Chris, you know, uh, my wife was a hockey mom because both my sons played in high school and my oldest son uh, played up at Bridgewater. And, you know, um, so I'm like, hey, you want, can we watch the Bruins tonight? Nah, you know, so I go in the other room. I watch the Bruins, you know. So then I'm like, hey, look, why don't we just put it on like the third period? You know, all right. So we come out third period, you know, the game's on. So the puck is going down this way and it just misses the net and it hits the crossbar and everything else. Next thing you know, I hear like, oh, ah, uh, pass it off. shoot it. Yeah. <laughs> And I'm like, look at you getting into the game. See that? There, there's nothing like playoff hockey when, oh. like, when when you get to that level and you get an overtime game and you're late yeah. in the third period and people are giving it everything they got because they want to win so bad. I mean, it, it's yeah. it's great. It's better. I say it's like a it's like a uh, you know what they say like a reality show because it really is. It's reality. <laughs> so my wife was oohing and ahhing and everything else. I said, see that? I'm gonna get you. I'm gonna get you hooked. We're gonna watch all the games for the rest of the way. <laughs> Hopefully there's enough of them. Yeah. Hopefully they don't get eliminated. Yeah. All right. right. Shout out to Bobby O'Brien for watching tonight. He said, great show. Don Andrews. And somebody from South Africa that checked in. This thing, you know, you never know where the show's going to end up. So uh, shout out to around the world. And hey, Coach Raleigh, always a, a pleasure. Thank you very much for your insight tonight. Uh, it's been great being on. I uh, appreciate it very much. All right. Continue to enjoy your retirement. Have some fun. And uh, let's see if the Bruins can get to the next round. I think he's going to play some golf, Paul. I really do. <laughs> I think he's going to play some golf. Yeah, by the way, Coach, if you have a chance, if you go back to my page, Paul Santos Live, you scroll back. I interviewed Tommy Mulligan last year after he had the cup. Oh, and, he, and he was there with the cup and all that. You know yeah. Tommy Mulligan, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah the trainer for the Tampa Bay. Yeah. You know, he yeah, was blowing in the – wasn't his first time raising the cup either. No, no, right. That's the second time he raised the cup. Yeah, exactly. Hey, thank you very much, Coach uh, Chris. This is Santos on Sports, and uh, we'll see you next time right here on Paul Santos Live. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.